Welcome Bethlehem Church Online family. I'm Casey. I'm Angela. And we are so glad you're joining us today. This has been an amazing week here at Bethlehem. So incredible. And so if you did not join us last week, it was Easter. Yes. And so amazing stories were shared. And so we'd love to hear from you what Easter meant to you. We don't want to move past it and just forget what God did because that's, it was incredible. That's so good, Casey. It's so important to coming out of a huge weekend like we just celebrated, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We want to stop and reflect and remember what all God did here. We saw so much life change. It was incredible. We know we have stories here. Uh, we saw the life change happen we want to hear from you too what did easter 2023 mean for you this year we'd love to hear that in the comments yes please put that down below and today is also a special day very special what is it today we're celebrating baptism and so for all of those people that gave their lives to christ made rededications made that first step in their faith journey with christ today is the day where they get a chance to go public with their faith through baptism and what baptism is is we are buried with christ in his death and raised to newness of life when we go down into the water we show that we are letting that old man die and we are coming up as a new creation in Christ. Now baptism is not salvation, salvation is the first step, but baptism is such a crucial next step mm -hmm. in our faith with Christ, step of obedience. It's so cool. It's one of our favorite things to do here yes. at Bethlehem. And so you get to be a part of that this morning. If you've never been baptized and you would like to take that step, we will do everything we can to make yes. that happen. Let us and know. So please let us know. We'd love to do that for you. But we're super excited. Yes. We also do have a special guest with us today, a dear friend of ours, Dave Edwards. So excited. Is here. So he has a great message for us today. And if you've never been to Bethlehem before, this is your first time watching, we'd love to hear from you too. So let us know below. I'd love to connect with you. You also will get a small glimpse of what a Sunday at Bethlehem looks like. So we'd love to meet you one day, but let yes. us know below. Um, again, love to connect with you, but we're about to jump in. Can't wait. Super excited. Thanks for joining us.
Y'all see the tubs. And just in case you've never been here before, okay, we get a little rowdy during baptisms. Then we like to get loud, don't we? So y'all go ahead and have a seat and direct your attention right over here. Morning, church. This is uh, one of my new little buddies. Uh, this is Colton Kiefer. And Colton is coming to be baptized this morning when I asked him, Hey, Colton, uh, what makes you want to be baptized this morning? He said, because I believe in Jesus and I want everybody to know. I said, well, buddy, I'm really excited for you. He goes, I'm really excited for me too. <laughs> but I'm also excited uh, about your future and about the kingdom because I just kind of have a feeling God's going to use you in big ways um, in the future and even now with your friends, family. I'm excited for you. The whole church is behind you, and we're with you, Colton. Okay, buddy. And uh, Colton has gone through kid faith. And Colton, we just have two questions for you. Have you trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? Yeah, and do you commit to following him for the rest of your life? Then it is my honor to baptize you, my little brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, this is Connor. It's his dad, uh, Blake. And so he'll be uh, assisting with the baptism day. But um, Connor's 12 years old. He attended Kid Faith and he understands uh, what it means to uh, live for Jesus. And he understands what this means today of going public uh, with your faith as we call it. So Connor, I got a couple of questions for you. Have you trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? And will you choose to follow him the rest of your life? So it is our honor and it's our pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is uh, Colton's cousin. This is Madison, Madison Haney, who is got a big cheering section and ha uh, is a, a freshman at Appalachie High School. And um, Madison has put her faith in Jesus, believes in Jesus. And I just love her understanding of baptism, um, that this is not just some religious thing to her. Um, her faith is really about a relationship with Jesus. That's what she's communicating. And she knows that. Um, and so we're just excited for you, Madison, to continue to grow in your relationship. And it's just a big day for you to take this uh, step of obedience in your faith. And we're with you. We're behind you. Uh, as a body, we have two questions for you. Have you trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? And do you commit to following him for the rest of your life? Really excited for you. It's my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hey, we're ready to celebrate over here. This is Declan. Declan is seven years old. He also attended Kid Faith. This is mom, Lauren. She's going to be helping 
uh, with the baptism here. It's always good to see not only two brothers getting baptized, but the whole family involved and invested in uh, following Jesus. That's what this is, right? This represents following Jesus, and this is telling, Declan wants to tell you today is that he's ready to follow Jesus the rest of his life. Ain't that right? Is that right? All right, so have you trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? And will you choose to follow him the rest of your life? So it is our honor and it's our privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Bailey, and uh, Bailey is uh, a senior at Appalachie High School. And uh, I'm just overwhelmed at what God is doing and continues to do in the next generation. We talk about it all the time. What's it gonna be like in the next generation? I think it's gonna be just fine. I think it's gonna be just fine. Bailey has an incredible story already as a senior in high school. I actually encouraged her to be writing, writing her story down so y'all can be looking for that book when it comes out. We'll uh, send an email when it's uh, published. But Bailey, uh, has gone through some challenges already in her life and overcome some really big stuff uh, and, and a loss of a family member that is uh, can be detrimental. And I just sat with her this morning saying this, it could have been the one thing that you ran away from God with and holding on to your hurt. And instead, she is surrendering to Jesus, has surrendered to Jesus, don't you make me cry, and instead is staying here and plugged in just to see what God would do with it if he brings it back to, if she brings it back to him. And so that's what this morning, yep. And so we love you and we're with you. And one of her mentors, Amanda, is here with us. And we understand God puts people in our path at the right time and on purpose. Bailey, have you trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? And do you commit to following him for the rest of your life? It is my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is Jordan. He's a really uh, close friend of mine. I've only known him since uh, probably the fall, right, of 22. So Jordan, his family, they joined small group with us. Um, him and Kelly joined small group with us last fall. And Jordan attended church here prior to that, but he's, he's, he was very skeptical of church. He was very skeptical of how the operation thing worked. He was very skeptical of God and Christianity, say the least, right? But he came to church, and he was a smart man because he came to church because he wanted to make his wife happy. So I, I'll, I'll give him a plus for that. Um, but he was not saved, and he'll tell you he was not saved. He did not know Jesus. He attended our small group. This is why small groups are so important. Him and his wife attended our small group, and he was not saved. He attended. And he probably attended because his wife wanted him to. But he came. And Jordan and I met. And we kind of hit it off right off the bat. And lo and behold, this all happened organically. Very organically. Jordan was alone by himself, kind of getting ready for work. And he fell to his knees. This is his words, not mine. He fell to his knees right where he was at, by himself. Nobody around except him and the Holy Spirit. And he asked Christ to come into his life and be his personal savior. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. And now he comes to me a couple of Sundays ago and said, listen, I want to know more about Jesus. Will you start meeting with me? And I'm like, yeah, man, this is shooting fish in a barrel. He goes, I want to know Jesus, but listen, I want to get baptized and I want you to do it. And Jordan, I want to tell you, it is an honor to baptize you, brother. And I feel like I have known you for years. And I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And I want to tell you today that I love you and I'm happy for you and I'm happy for Kelly. I'm happy for your family. And I want to tell you today that I am so proud of you. I'm so proud of where you're going and where you've come. So Jordan, I probably, I probably already told the answers, but have you trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? And will you choose to live for him the rest of your life? So Jordan, it is my honor and it's my privilege to baptize you, brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job. 
Amen. Amen. Church, this is my friend. This is Ryan Wilbanks, and uh, Ryan is coming to be baptized this morning and has several, several uh, family that actually drove over three hours to get here this morning to be here to celebrate what God is doing in him. And real briefly, here's the story. It was, it was religion. It was being around church. It was being around the things of God and thinking that he was good. Just like, just like Pastor Jason was saying just a couple of weeks ago, it was just kind of average status quo until recently, last couple of months, God has woken something up, awakened, I don't know how to say that, but it's big. Whatever it is, say, you know, has just brought him to this realization, maybe what I, I don't really have Jesus. Maybe I just have an idea. And in the last couple of months, if you have a conversation with him, it's magnetic, it's full of energy, like full of life, new life. And uh, just excited to see how God is going to use you uh, as you have put your faith in Jesus. And in front of our church here, our family, we have two questions for you, my brother. Have you trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? And do you commit to following him for the rest of your life? It is my honor, my brother, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is my mom, Judy. Yeah. So I probably should have known this before, but she approached me about a month ago and said, I've never been baptized, and I want you to baptize me. And first I was shocked because I just, I guess I made the mistake and assumed that she had been baptized. But she had not been baptized. She said, I've been sprinkled as a little girl, but I want to get baptized. Now, I'm thinking at her age, she had every reason, every excuse from a worldly view to say, listen, I'm saved. I don't really have nothing to prove. I'm, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. But this proves today, going public with her faith, it proves, Mom, that God has more for you. And he has more for anybody at an older person's age. And seniors, I want to tell you that. But, Mom, you probably didn't even mean to or know it, but... Without even knowing or trying, I want to tell you a few things. You exemplify Christ to us as children. Is that you were selfish. You were loyal. You always picked your kids over everything else, even your own. I remember you working two jobs to pay for braces. And I remember that you bought us things that we needed and sometimes bought us things, well, a lot of times for your baby boy. You bought us things that we didn't need. And I just want to say thank you, and you exemplify Christ even when you wasn't trying. And maybe you wasn't living for the Lord. I don't know, but you exemplify Christ. But my mom did get saved, and she got sprinkled. And so today, this is one of the most special days of my life. I, I told someone today, I haven't been this nervous since my wedding, I think. And um, I always get a little nervous doing baptism, but man, this is special. This is like, this is in the realm of baptizing your kids. And normally... Your parents get baptized before, sometimes before you're even born, right? But I get to baptize my mom. How cool is that? So mom, have you asked Jesus into your heart to be your personal savior? And will you choose to follow him the rest of your life? So it is my honor and it's my pleasure as your son to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
So Father, we say thank you with grateful hearts. And Lord, it's so evident that you're doing something in family. So right now, we just ask God that every family that's represented here tonight, Lord, those with lost people in them, God, that you would just even now start calling them forth into salvation. And Lord, that people that are not even here, their hearts would start to be turned toward you because that's the power in the name of Jesus alone. Lord, we love you. We give you thanks that you set us free. We give you thanks for Jesus. Lord, I pray that blind eyes and deaf ears are open this morning in the name of Jesus. Everything that we do is for you and your glory and it's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray and all God's people said amen you guys can be seated amen. good morning everybody man it's been a good morning so far hasn't it so much fun this morning we've seen people baptized at all the services across all the campuses so it's just been an incredible incredible morning so glad that you're here my name is Kevin I'm one of the pastors here and I get the privilege of saying welcome if this is your first time or maybe the first time in a long time we are so glad that you're here. If you're looking for a way, maybe it's not your first time, you've been here a while, and you're looking for a way to get connected, the easiest way to do that is through a connection card that we have. So if you take your phone out and you scan the QR code on the screen, that'll take you to a place where you can fill out a form. At the bottom of that form, there are a list of things that are going on here at our church. You can check those that you're interested in, and we'll be sure to get some information to you on those things as quickly as we can. And again, so thrilled that you're here, whether you're in the room with us or you're watching online. So glad we get to worship together. My hope is that you will take advantage, if you're in the room here, and meet some of the people right around you. And maybe you see them every week for years, but you still don't know their name. We'll throw all the excuses out today and just introduce yourself because there's some great people sitting right around you. If you, at the bottom of that connection card, there's an event coming up in a couple weeks that we are really excited about. Um, it's coming up on April 29th. It's our women's breakfast. It's a great, great event that we really believe in. We know it's super powerful. We know God uses it to impact lives. Um, it, it's time where you can be encouraged. It's a time where you'll get to worship together. You'll get to hear from some of the ladies in our church. And ladies, we want to make sure that you know about it, and we want you to register. In fact, we believe in it so much, we, we showed us a story last week of one of our young ladies who one of the tools God used to draw her back to God was by her mom inviting her to the women's breakfast last year. We believe it's that powerful and it's an easy invite. So here's the key, ladies. We need you to register. It's just a couple weeks away and we need you to register because the worst thing that can happen at a women's breakfast is we have lots of women and no breakfast. So we need you to register. Guys, you go ahead and make whatever arrangements you need to get to get to do babysitting so that your wife can come and and actually, it's not babysitting, it's called being a father. So do what you need to do to be a father and watch your own kids so that your wife can come and be encouraged and uh, be challenged. It's going to be a great event. So go, ladies, go ahead and start signing up now. Scan that QR code on the screen. You can also find that, connect, you can find that registration form on the website if you go to the events page or if you go to the Bethlehem Church app and get on the events tile, um, you can find it there as well. Every week when we gather together, we get to worship through celebrating new life. We get to celebrate uh, through music and worship through music. Uh, we get to worship through studying God's word together and just being together. And then each week we get to worship through giving. It's a real way that we put God first. And you can see on the screen there's four ways to give here at Bethlehem Church. And we always want to say thank you to all of you who have already given online or given in advance or who are giving this week and, and give week in and week out because it really fuels ministry here at our church, in our church, in our community, and literally all over the world. And so we say thank you, and then we wanna make sure that we invite every, everybody to be a part of what God's doing here in worship through giving. We have a special guest with us here today, so if you'll go ahead and get your app open or your note sheet out, you're gonna need a copy of God's Word, whether that's a paper copy or a digital copy. Um, you've heard this speaker before, he's not new to Bethlehem, uh, and we're excited about having him here today. Uh, pastor Jason is going to get the privilege of introducing him, but I get the privilege of introducing my pastor, Pastor Jason Britt. Thanks, Kev. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, thank you guys for worshiping with us across our campuses. Thanks for last weekend. It was Easter weekend. We celebrated the resurrection. Uh, 17 services, three campuses over four days awesome time. So many of you invited folks. So many of you people uh, volunteered. You gave of your time. Uh, we're baptizing all day. And many of the people that we've baptized uh, made decisions at Easter. So it was an awesome time. And just to celebrate, to remind us of the magnitude of what we get to be a part of. Uh, and we don't normally, we're not a church that posts numbers or anything like that, but just to celebrate, last weekend across 17 services, three campuses, more than 9,000 people celebrated Jesus at Bethlehem Church. Uh, 
alive. Thank you guys so much. It was an awesome, awesome time. It was a blast. Next weekend, I kick off a series called Out of Context. And the simple idea is there's a lot of quick little Christian cliches that we think are scriptural or biblical. There are things that we've heard said or we say that we claim our life on that are not even in the Bible. And so we're just going to go after like, like, if you have enough faith, that can fix anything. Really? Faith can fix anything? Well, we're going to talk about that. I'm just waiting to decipher and to learn, and I'm trying to figure out God's will. We're going to dive into that. Where's that in Scripture? Right? And raise up a child in the way they should go, and they will not depart from it. That's a proverb, not a promise. What's the difference? Right, we're going to talk about those things starting next week. A series called Out of Context, because here's what we know. There are things that are true, and when we claim and stake our life on what is true, God leads us to freedom. But when we believe faulty assumptions, we live in captivity. And so we just want to kind of open up the scripture and see what it says. This week, just like last year, this time, the week after Easter, thank you for being kind and giving me a break, because I preached a few times last week, and I'm still getting my voice 100% back. And so my friend, Dave Edwards, Dave was here last Easter or the week after Easter. Dave travels the country. He's been traveling for years. He's from Oklahoma. He's a great Bible teacher. He's a great friend. He's authored many books. Dave speaks to hundreds of thousands of people around our country every year. He and I have been friends for 20 years. As good a Bible teacher, opening the word and laying it out. He's a funny dude. He's a fun guy. We've been friends for years. Will you give a warm welcome to my friend, Dave Edwards. All right. All right. Good morning, church. I'm so glad to get to be back. When Pastor Jason calls me and said, I want you to come back, I said, let me pray about that. Okay. And uh, it was an easy, easy call to make. I love being here. I love being a part of your church and what God is doing. I'm, I'm, you know, Jason, Pastor Jason is an incredible pastor. You're blessed to have a guy who loves Jesus and teaches the Bible faithfully. And would you just say thank you for his leadership and his love for you? Would you give him a round of applause? Just let him know you love him. So good. And I heard you had an incredible Easter. What a powerful thing. This has been a great weekend. I have to say, you know, I've done a lot of Easter's in my lifetime. I've been a believer for a while. And as much as I love Easter, I've never really understood how the bloody execution of the Son of God came to be represented by eggs. I don't really get that. It seems that's such a weird thing. But I think I figured it out. When you go to the grocery store and you buy a carton of eggs, how many eggs come in a carton? How many disciples were there? And every time you get a dozen eggs, there's always that one cracked one. That's the evil Judas egg. That's what that is. That's, that's as clear lines as I can draw to that. So before I, I was, you know, they say you have to know your lane. And I, I've known Pastor Jason, we've 20 plus years. And, but before I was a speaker, I was working at a local church. And my church sent me to be a summer missionary in California which meant I had to do everything. I did the events, I did the speaking, but I also was a counselor. And I just, I wanna put this up front, I'm not a counselor, it's not my lane. I'm not, I don't, I'm just not a counselor. I, like I, when I was in California, you know, doing student ministry, kids would come to my office and they'd go, I hate my mom. I'm like, oh, grow up, we hate your mom too. And uh, <laughs> we wish she'd leave the church. And uh, so I was not gifted at counseling. Here's me in every counseling situation. Well, you just got to snap out of it. And that's it. That's it. So I have to say I had 100% success rate because every person I told that to never came back. And uh, so so happy about that. And so what I want to talk to us about today can be a little bit counsely, but it, my job is to teach the Word. That's what I do. I'm a teacher. I'm a preacher. That's what I do. But I want to talk to us this morning about something that we've all experienced at different times in our life, at different seasons. I want to talk about what happens when we get stuck. People get stuck. People can get stuck in a habit. People can get stuck in an attitude. People can get stuck in a lifestyle. People can get stuck in a memory. A lot of people get stuck in the past, and all they can think about is, I wish I could go back to the past. I wish it was the way that it used to be. People get stuck in a habit, and they think, I, I can't see myself getting out of this, and they continue to fall victim to it. No matter, no matter how many times they pray and ask God to take it away, it seem, they seem to be stuck in it. Some people get stuck in success. 
Some people get stuck in just doing the thing, and they just work all the time, and they get caught up in it. They never think about the future, never think about how God can do it. They're just stuck in working all the time. Some people get stuck in busyness. I bet in a crowd this size, we've got a number of parents that you're busy. Your kids are busy. You're busy. you got school. you got sports. And you have it every day, and it, it seems like it never stops. And you get caught up in the current of the business, and there's a lot of motion, but you're not gaining any ground. And you think, man, I'm tired, and I'm busy, and I'm doing all this stuff, but I'm not going anywhere. We can get stuck in a lot of different ways. You ever got your car stuck? in the mud and you know what it's like where that tire bears down the mud and the more you press on the gas the more dirt flies up and you don't gain any traction it's like that we get stuck in things we get stuck in good things we get stuck in struggles some people get stuck in their struggles some people get stuck in suffering some people get stuck in a particular season in their in their uh, relationship or in their marriage the marriage just hits a place where you're like it's it's not bad but it's not good either and we feel like we're stuck if you ever tried to download a video on your phone and watch that phone buffer, a lot of people's life feels like that. It's just buffering and buffering, and it, there's no real traction. You're just stuck. And one of the works of the cross is to get us unstuck. One of the things that the resurrection of Jesus accomplished was the ability for his people to live forward and to move forward. And so the question then is this morning, how do you get unstuck? If you got your listening guide, your little note page, I entitled this sermon, Unstuck Me, because I don't, it's grammar, grammatically not correct, but it sounds good, right? It's memorable, because I want to talk to us this morning about how we get unstuck from where we are. How do we get unstuck and find traction to move forward in wherever that stuckness may be for you? How do we do it? Well, this is what brings me to my text this morning. In Exodus chapter 4, we pick up part of the life story of a guy named Moses. Moses had grown up in the ultimate gated community. He grew up in a place called Egypt. He was the ultimate insider. And one day he sees an Egyptian beating an Israelite, and he freaks out, and he kills this Egyptian and buries him in the sand. And Moses realized what he did was wrong, and no one, no one gave him a hero's uh, welcome for it. And he runs off to a place called Midian. And he spends the next 40 years of his life in Midian. While he's there, he gets married. He has some kids. He goes to work for his father-in-law as a shepherd. And Moses spends the next 40 years of his life shepherding a herd of sheep around the backside of Midian. He came to know the back roads and the crevices and the creases of those hills. He knew it well. Every day for Moses was the same. He would get up, he'd go to work, he would herd the sheep and do his work, and he would come back home. And for Moses, Midian became a place of comfort, but it also became a place where he was stuck. Every day was the same, and it wasn't bad, but he was stuck. He wasn't really moving forward, but he wasn't moving backwards. He was just stuck. Some of us know how that feels as a parent, to be stuck in something. Stuck in a moment. Stuck in in some season of a relationship, stuck being a parent, and then all of a sudden you're an empty nester, and you're like, I don't know what to do with my life. And Moses in Midian was stuck. And one day God came to Moses and said, Moses, I'm going to do something brand new in you. I'm going to take you out of this place called Midian. I'm going to send you back to Egypt, and you're going to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. And the opening of Exodus chapter 4, all of Moses' stuckness, all of, his, all of his objections begin to rise to the surface, and he says to God, I can't do this, and what if I fail, and what if they don't believe me, and who should I say sent me? It's his stuckness. It's Midian speaking back. Some of us know what it's like to hear your habit speak back to the Lord, to hear where you're stuck Speak back to the Lord. God, I can't move forward. It's never going to be the same. I got this thing hanging over my head. I got this shadow that follows me of my past mistakes, and it continues to whisper. That stuckness continues to talk you into staying. And Moses is like, I don't want to do this. It's not going to work. And God doesn't yell at Moses. Not like I'm yelling at you right now. And God doesn't yell at Moses. He doesn't preach at him. He gives him three object lessons. He basically takes Moses back to children's church. All right, and in Exodus chapter 4, he uses three objects. Now, this is real simple, right? He uses the staff of Moses, he uses the hand of Moses, and he uses a pitcher of water. And each one of those objects is a choice that we need to make if we're going to move forward. If you're stuck at any level of your life, if you're stuck financially, you're stuck in an addiction, if you're stuck in any place, these are the three choices that every one of us need to make in order to move forward. Right? So here we go. Let, let, let's look at it. Exodus chapter 4. If you got it on your phone, you can look at it. Or if you got it, a real Bible, you can look at it. All right? So 
I always say if your phone, if your Bible lights up, it's not a Bible, all right, it's a phone, all right, so anyway, here we go, so look at this, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1, watch this, then Moses said, what if they won't believe me? I'm stuck here in Midian. This is all I've ever known. I can't imagine myself outside of this place where I've been stuck. For they may say the Lord has not appeared to you. And the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? I'm sure Moses is thinking, it's a staff. I mean, you're God. You're all knowing. You should have gotten that one, right? Fairly obvious. Verse 3, look at it. Then he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. And really, who wouldn't? If you drop anything on the ground that turns into a snake, where are you going to be? I'm going to be in the other room with the door locked. Unless, of course, you're a middle schooler, then you try to get really close to it and blow it up with an M80. But testimony time later. All right, so that's a whole other sermon. All right, so. But the Lord said to Moses, verse 4, stretch out your hand and grasp it by the tail. Now, in my Bible, there's a little dash after the word tail to signify the amount of time that Moses was going. What? Stretch out your hand and grasp it by the tail. Let me just say, God, it's your world and we're all just living in it. But let me just point out, that's possibly the deadliest place to grab a snake. I'll do it, but just tell my family I said bye. All right, I, I, that's what's going on in that little dash. You can have to imagine. And so he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. Choice number one, handle your power with care. Now Moses was a shepherd. He made his living with that staff. That staff wasn't a fashion accessory. That didn't, it wasn't something he carried to thinking that I'll need this when they do Old Testament oil paintings of me, right? This, this was, he was a shepherd. He made his living with that staff. He fought off foxes. He saved stray sheep with that staff. That staff represented his skill set as a shepherd. It represented his source of income, his ability to provide for himself and his wife and his kids. Wrapped up in that staff was his history as a shepherd. Some people say that a shepherd would carve the history of his shepherding onto the staff. And for God, anybody, God included, to say to a shepherd, throw your staff down was a big stinking deal. What we're watching here is not just Moses tossing a stick on the ground. When Moses lays that staff on the ground, symbolically, he's letting go of his ability to provide. He's letting go of his job, his skill set, his family, his identity, his security. That staff represented his routine and what he did every day for 40 years, and he's letting it go. Let me tell you why this matters. It's through the staff that the plagues against Pharaoh are going to be issued. It's through that staff that the Red Sea is going to be parted. But for that to happen, God had to own the man and all that his life contains. It's about ownership. What we're watching in these verses is a transfer of ownership. God says to him, what is that in your hand? He says, a staff. He lays it down. He picks it back up. And after this whole conversation, look at what verse 21 says about the staff. It'll be on your, on your screen. Look at this. So Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey, returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses also took the staff of God. Verses 3 and 4, what is it? It's a staff. It's his staff. He lays it down. He picks it back up. And now it's become the staff of God. We're watching a transfer of ownership. Christianity is about transferring the ownership of our life over to Jesus. This is why every time when you come to church and you watch a baptism, you watch a story, and you hear a sermon, someone talks about giving your life to Christ because Christianity begins when we take our life and we lay it down before him. We say, God, it's not my life anymore. I surrender it to you. Christianity begins when we surrender the will of our life to the leadership of Jesus. Some people get stuck because they hold on to their staffs too tight. They hold on to their history. They hold on to their routine. They hold on to the way it's always been. And God says, I want you to throw it down. He didn't ask Moses to throw it away. He asked him to throw it down. Do you see it? Because it's about a transfer of ownership. Listen, church. For God to use a life, he must first own it. For God to use a skill set. For God to use a relationship. For God to use an opportunity. For God, for God to use a, a situation. He must first own it in our life. There must be a transfer in which we say, God, I want you to know that I know that this stuff is not mine. I surrender my life to you. And some people get stuck because they're trying to control it. You know, in these verses, 
he tells Moses, he throws the staff down, it becomes a snake. And then he tells him to pick it up by the tail. And let me tell you what that represents. It represents a change in leadership. Most people would grab it by the head. They would control it. Most people take on life. You're an entrepreneur. You grab it by the head. You control the situation. And now God is shifting the way Moses is going to think about his life from moving from him always being in control to picking it up by the tail so God can be in control. It's, it's unnatural. It's different. This is why Jesus says if you want to find your life, you must first lose it. If you want to be the, the greatest, you have to become the servant. It, it's upside down that we, we pick life up from a different vantage point. We pick it up from the Lordship. And we say, God, you're the Lord. I'm holding this by the tail and trusting you to be my source and to protect me. You see it? So he says to Moses, you've got to handle your power with care that you come to a point which you realize that our life and all of its contents are not our own. Moses had carried that staff for 40 years, herded sheep for 40 years, and it never occurred to him that there was anything other than just what he used it for until he laid it down and he picked it up and it became the staff of God. Let me just say, you'll never discover your purpose until you're willing to lay your life down. You'll never discover the greater purpose for all the things that are in your life until you're willing to lay them down. Moses, it was just a job. He was a shepherd. And when he laid that staff down and picked it back up, God revealed to him that there was a greater purpose for all of the stuff in his life. There was a greater purpose for the skill set, that there, his life wasn't his own. This idea that our life is not our own, the church is the only institution that I know that is teaching this to our culture. Our culture doesn't say your life is not your own, you should surrender the stuff in your life. They say the opposite. You know, in my travels, a lot of the way I understand Scripture comes from the events that happened to me. And I, I, I forget, I was flying somewhere, and I was flying coach, and I fly coach like everybody else. But I don't fit in those seats. I'm, I don't look tall from the distance, but I'm 6'4", but when you get up close to me, I'm quite frightening. And, uh, and so this is a good distance for you to see me because I look normal and thin. And uh, so I'm not dieting. I'm just speaking in bigger rooms. That's how I look thinner. And so... Um, but I was in this, I was in a coach seat, and I, I have to kind of cram myself up to get in the seat. Like, I, I don't fit in it. I look like a Shriner driving a clown car. You know what I'm saying? So I'm kind of in it. I got my little Diet Coke in my hand, and the guy in front of me decides he wants to turn his seat into a Sir to Perfect sleeper. And he starts mashing on the button on the little armrest and banging into the seat and mashing on the button and banging into the seat. And every time he did the seat, would jam into my knees and pain would shoot through my body. And he turns around and says to me, would you please let me lean my seat back? I was like, I'm not stopping you. It's just that I can't become smaller. <laughs> he turns around like, ah, angry, like, <laughs> angry, you know. I was like, I don't know where all this anger is coming from. And 30 seconds passes, and he starts it again. Like something has changed. He starts mashing, mashing the button, banging on the seat, like I'm just going to take my kneecaps off and go, well, come on back. I don't know what I was thinking. Let me just <laughs> set those over there. He's mashing the button, and banging on the seat. He turns around, and he goes, it's my right to lean my seat back. I went, not when I had to dislocate my hips to do it. <laughs> and so I don't know what, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm like this, you know. And he gets up, and I think, well, he's just moved into another part of the plane. I ticked him off, and sorry about that. You know, what can I say? I can't, I can't be more wadded up. And a few minutes passes, and he comes back with a flight attendant. He comes back with a flight attendant and points at me and goes, there he is, that's the one right there. And I'm, I'm like this, in my seat, you know, I'm all crammed up, I've got my Coke in my hand, you know. And the flight attendant looks at me and turns to the guy and goes, sir, you need to sit down, you need to calm down. And I go, see? <laughs> I'll never forget that guy turn around and saying to me, it's my right to lean my seat back. I go, ooh, aren't you special, right? I mean, but this is the way our culture thinks. Right, my money, my right, my body, my right, my stuff, my right, my life, my right, my weekend, my right, my friends, my right. But if we're ever going to get free, we have to come to the end of ourselves and to surrender our life and the contents and say, God, I give up my rights and I give my right to follow you. Do you see it? And if we're ever going to get unstuck, we have to learn to handle what God's given us with care. Live with it with an open hand and just say, God, the stuff, the relationships, 
the marriage, the opportunity, the job, it's not mine. You'll never discover the purpose for what you have in your life until you lay it down. And when Moses picks it back up, he heads off out of Midian towards Egypt with the staff of God. If we're going to get unstuck, we have to learn to handle our power with care. Not only that, but number two, that's just point one. All right, so number two, watch this. Number two, now the Lord furthermore, verse six, the Lord furthermore said to him, now put your hand over your heart. Watch this. So he put his hand over his heart. And when he took it out, behold, it was leprous like snow. So God and Moses are speaking. Moses has his little shepherd toga on. He takes his hand. He puts it over his heart. He pulls it out. It's covered with leprosy. Now, I don't expect you to know this, but leprosy was nasty. It was, it was contagious. It was incurable. And leprosy, the, what it would do is it would start in a place of the flesh, and it, as it would move, it would eat its way through the flesh and create numbness, and it was followed by death. And so people's hands and arms would just fall off because of leprosy. It, it, was, it was a contaminant. It would spread and kill the flesh. So here's God and Moses speaking. Moses takes his hand, puts it over his heart, pulls it back out, and it's covered with leprosy. I'm sure he has to be thinking, how is this going to help me with Pharaoh? Do I just walk into his court and fling my hand at him, make everyone go, ew, that is so sick. Right? In the next verse, so what happens? So look what he does. Uh, then he said, put your hand over your heart again. And when he put his hand over his heart, he took it out, and behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Choice number two, hate your private corruption. Hate your private corruption. Now, I use this word hate because I know it'll trigger a lot of people. But when it comes to getting unstuck, you'll never get unstuck from something until you hate where you are. Until you get dissatisfied enough with a habit or an attitude, enough to do something about it. Moses had never fit in. From the moment that he was fished out of the Nile by Pharaoh's daughter, he had always been an outsider. He was an outsider to the Egyptians. He was an outsider to the Israelites. Even when he led them up to the edge of the promised land, they never really got along with him. They never liked him. Moses never was accepted by the Egyptians. He was never accepted by the Israelites. He was never received. He spent his whole life feeling like an outcast. And that feeling ate its way through his heart. It started from the moment he, they took him out of the Nile, and it spread through his life decade after decade after decade and God knew it was there, and he said, Moses, if you don't deal with it, it's going to eat its way through your life. And it was ultimately the thing that kept him out of the promised land. It ate its way through his life. And so he says, you've got to hate this private corruption enough to do something about it. You've got to hate it. Let me, let me show you how this works, ready? Here's the principle in these verses. The hand represents what Moses was called to do. He's called to go to Egypt to deliver Israel. When he takes his hand and he places it over his heart, this is the text and God's way of teaching Moses and you and I that whatever lives in our heart will leak its way into what we do. That we can't separate who we are from what we do. That, man, if it's a mess in your heart, it'll leak its way into your home life. If it's a mess in your marriage, it'll leak its way into your job. That whatever lives in here has a way of showing up out here. You know, the world is chaotic, and there's not a lot we can control. But there's three things we all have control over. The contents of our heart, what we think about, what we carry in our heart, and what we pray about. And when corruption sets into someone's life, it sets into their thought life, it sets into the contents of their heart, and it sets into what they focus their prayer life on. And so the energy of the text is that we have to hate it enough to do something about it. Come to a point where we're like, I don't want to live this way anymore. I don't want to stay in this place anymore. That level of hate. Let me see if I can, uh, let me see if I can illustrate. Let's take a little survey by show of hands, right? By show of hands. How many of you guys have a pet peeve? How many of y'all have something that ticks you off by show of hands? Let me just see it. Let's get it way up there. That's nice. Married people pointing at each other, the over the head part. That's not very Christian. Some of y'all been married long enough that everything's a pet peeve. You're like, I just hate the way they breathe in and out. And uh, <laughs> sorry, too bitter for this late before noon. 
We all, I mean, we all got stuff. Some, uh, how many of you guys have driving pet peeves? Anybody get irritated when you have to drive for someone who's driving 40 miles an hour in the left lane with their blinker on for no apparent reason? I can't take it. Right? I, I asked, a, I asked a, a crowd this question a couple weeks ago. I said, well, did someone yell out a pet peeve? And this lady said, I hate people who lie. And I thought she said, I hate people who fly. I'm like, I don't even know how to take that, right? I don't, I don't know how that pet peeve works. Like you're just, you see an aircraft, you're like, I hate all of those people right there. It's just free-floating anger towards random aircraft above you. You're like, I hate people who fly. You know, well, you know, let me tell you, you know, I, I grew up in a house full of women, so I learned early on for a woman in the house, the pet peeve is the toilet seat. The toilet seat. Ladies, let me just, let me just, I've asked this to the women in my house can you not see that it's up? I, I don't know what's happening. Apparently women are just flinging the bathroom door open and backing in like this. They're just not, they're just backing in. And every year we're losing hundreds of women. They just disappear. There's men in the hallway going, I don't know, she went in, she never came out. I don't, it's like a magic room. I don't even know what happened. And, you know, guy, granted, guys, we're not that observant, but, you know, you know, ladies, you could at least just kick it down with your foot. It seems like it. But for a lot of people, like, it gets on their, like, they, they lose their mind over it. They just, they, they lose it, you know. Well, since we're bonding this morning, <laughs> let, me, uh, let me tell you one of my pet peeves. If I'm not behind sort of perfect sleeper guy who's trying to recline his seat, I hate it when I get behind a kid who wants to play peekaboo with me. I can't, yes. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. Now, like, I don't have anything critical to say to parents or grandparents. If you raise kids, you got grandkids, you deserve a trophy, award, a medal or something. I don't know anything. I don't think about kids. Here's my entire skill set with kids, right? I'm going to show you. Hello. That's it. That's all I know. After that, that's, <laughs> that's all I know. I, I know that when little kids walk, they look like little drunk people. And uh, when they ask for food, they look like drunk homeless people. And that's all I really know. But if I get behind a kid who's popping over that seat, if I'm on a 30-minute flight, okay, I can play along. Oh, aha! I, you know, I can act surprised for 30 minutes. But if I'm on a two-hour flight and we're rolling into that second hour and I'm running out of ways to reference expressions of surprise, I just want to grab that kid every time he pops over the seat and go, listen, it's always going to be me. <laughs> Sit down. I can't take it. Well, you just watched me have a meltdown. I just, you just went to therapy with me, right? I mean, I th think about this. A moment ago, when I asked how many of y'all pet peeves, almost every hand went up. If we had time. Uh, some of y'all got eating pet peeves and the people eating with their mouth open. Some of y'all are neat freaks. We all got stuff that gets on our last nerve. And isn't it crazy how we can be so passionate about things that don't matter? And yet at the same time, we let so much stuff live in here that really does. Our pet peeves, we police them. We're like, don't, don't make that noise at the table, right? Pick this place up. I can't stand to see it. I don't want to hear it. Just get it. We, man, we get it out of our presence. Let me ask you a question. Can you imagine how different our experience with the presence of the Lord would be if we were as passionate about dealing with the contents of our heart as we are about our pet peeves? That if we had the same vigilance over what we carry, as we do about our pet peeves, don't do this in my presence. If we say, God, I don't want anything to live inside of here, that could break your heart. And could I just suggest this morning that maybe it's time for some of us to clear out the clutter of our heart. You know why people get stuck? Because they tolerate stuff in their heart that doesn't need to be there. They learn to put up with it. They live with it. Agitation, frustration, irritation unforgiveness, bitterness, decades of stuff that's been layered and stacked up in our heart that we just carried with us. We replay offenses, we replay failures, we replay all these things. And God's saying to Moses, Moses, whatever you pull out, you got to deal with it. And I wonder, church, how long has it been since you've asked God to fall fresh on you? You said, God, I let some stuff stack up my heart and some of it I got reasons and I got stories for why I let it do that, but I, it, it, it's made me stuck. I've gotten stuck. I'm in a place where I'm stuck because I've just learned to tolerate this stuff. And 
Lord, I need you to fall fresh on me, to wash over me, and give me a clean heart. And maybe for some of us, it's time that we just peel back the layers. It takes a lot of courage to peel back the layers of our heart and to say, all is not well in here. i got some stuff I just need to empty out. I've got some clutter I need to clear out. Do you see it? So he says to Moses, you've got to handle your power with care. You've got to hate private corruption. You've got to hate it enough to do something about it. And then number three, look at this. Look where this comes from. Look what he says. Verse 8. Now watch this. Look at verse 8. And if they will not believe or listen to the witness of the first sign, that they may believe the witness of the last sign. So he's talking about the hand and the staff, right? But if they will not believe even these two signs or listen to what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on dry ground. Now, now look at this. And then look at it. And the water which you pour on the for, take uh, the water which uh, you pour from the Nile will become blood on dry ground. Now, if you're not used to reading the Old Testament, this sounds like some line out of a Stephen King novel, like blood on dry ground. You're like, what in the world is this about? Well, what I want you to see, I want you to look at this verse on the screen. And I want you to see how God is qualifying how this sign works. Look what he says. But if. He's giving conditions. He says if they reject the first two signs, then, right? If they reject these two signs and, and uh, take some water and pour from the Nile on dry ground, and the water which you pour on the Nile from dry ground will become blood on dry ground, right? He said then you can do it. So God is putting the condition on this sign of how it will work. In other words, what's he doing? He's teaching Moses how to do it. Choice number three, if you're taking notes, honor God's personal counsel. Honor God's personal counsel. In other words, Moses had picked up some negative ideas about himself while he lived in Midian. I'm getting what I deserve. I'll never outlive this mistake that I made. My life's never going to go beyond this moment. I know God loves me, but I, I don't think things could ever change. I know that he's real, but I'm not sure I'll ever get out of this place. Moses had picked up a negative mindset. And now what God's doing is he's shifting the mindset of Moses to begin to learn to be led by the Spirit. And God says, only under these conditions will this sign work. When I tell you to do it, I want you to do it. He's teaching Moses. So choice number three is that we have to learn to be teachable. You know what it means to be teachable? It means to be willing to admit you don't know it all. It means to be willing to say, there's some things in my life I'm good at. There's some things I really understand. But there's some things in my life that I know that I don't know that only God knows. And so I'm going to follow his lead. So look what God says to Moses about what he's going to do. Look at verse 12. Now then go, I, even I, will be your mouthpiece. Look what he says. And teach you what to say. <laughs> do you see it? God's saying, Moses, I'm going to lead you through it. Whatever you've been stuck in, I'm going to lead you up out of it and into the next place where I want you to be. So God doesn't just push us out of this world and say, hey, good luck with that. You're on your own. Instead, he enters into our struggles. He enters into the places where we're stuck and creates traction by leading us to, to get up out of it. You see it? He, he's a teacher. So one of the things you can count on as you work at, up out of the place where you've been stuck is for God to lead you and direct you. That we get to a place where we learn to be led by God's spirit. That we, and the way this starts is you say, God, whatever you have for me, what do you have for me? And what do you want from me? I'm open. I'm open to you, and I'm open to be led. And as long as Moses did these three things, he was on the front end of some of the greatest miracles of the Old Testament. Think there ever wasn't a moment that he didn't pick that staff up, that he didn't expect to see a serpent in his hand, that he didn't hear the voice of God saying, you handle what I've given you with care. Keep your hand open, keep your heart open, and you'll be able to move through this season of your life. You think there ever wasn't a moment when he woke up before, while all of Israel is still asleep in the camp and put his toga on and crossed his toga that he didn't expect to pull his hand out and see leprosy, that he didn't hear the Spirit of God saying, you keeping your heart clean? You keeping a short sin list? Got anything you need to confess, repent of, get right? Keep your heart open. Think there ever wasn't a moment that he didn't want to quit like he did in Exodus 34 where he said to God, you can't fire me, I quit. And God said, I'm not done with you yet. 
I'm going to teach you how to get through this next stage and phase of your life. I came this morning to tell you that wherever you got stuck, God can unstuck you. These are the choices that we have to make in order to get our life unstuck. And these, I call it unstuck me because these three choices are also descriptors of what it looks like to live an unstuck life. What's it look like for someone to be unstuck? It means they're handling their power with care. What's it look like for someone to live an unstuck life? They're keeping their heart clean. On a daily basis, like, God, I'm just confessing where I'm at, what I'm carrying. I want to keep my heart clean. I still got struggles, but I'm going to keep it in front of you. I still, I'm still tempted to relapse, but I'm going to keep it in front of you and hold it with an open hand. God, I'm facing some stuff I don't understand, so you teach me, you lead me. This is why you have a church, why you have pastors, why you have a staff. you got people around you that can help you to navigate the voice of God. As long as Moses did those three things, he saw incredible demonstration of God. I came this morning to tell you that you can get unstuck and you can live that way. And maybe this morning the starting place for some of us is that where Moses started is to surrender our life, to lay our life down before the Lord and to say, God, I want to give you my life. So I'm going to ask just for a minute, church, if you would, just to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to run a check on your life this morning. If you've ever been in a place where you said, I believe in Jesus, but he's not real to me. I don't sense his peace. I don't sense his presence in my life. I've heard the story. I've been to church. But what you talked about, surrendering your will and having him live inside of you, I, that's not real to me. But I want him to be. Or if you say this morning, sometimes I think I'm a believer, other times I think I'm not, and the truth is I just don't know. I go back and forth. That the starting place for getting your life to move forward and the starting place for getting unstuck is when we surrender our life to Jesus. If you've never done that, if you've doubted and have been uncertain, I'm going to invite you this morning to pray this prayer with me. The prayer is not magic. But there's something about praying a prayer with your head and your heart at the same time that it kicks open a place where the Spirit of God can come and live inside of you. And that's what this prayer is about. It's about saying, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. If you've never done that, would you just pray this with me in your head and your heart this morning? Would you just say, dear Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God and that you died on a cross for me. And I believe that you're alive. And as best as I know how, I ask you to step out of heaven and step into my heart and be the leader and the Lord of my life. Say it to him. I confess I've been stuck. But today I surrender my life to you. I surrender my life to you. Now and forevermore, I'm yours. If you just prayed that prayer to me and you meant it with all your heart, would you just put your eyeballs right on me? Just lift your head and look right here at me. If you just now prayed that prayer and you meant it with all your heart, just look right here at me. Just keep them on me just for a second. If you got your eyes on me, and you say, man, I prayed that prayer, and I meant it with all my heart. Would you just lift your hand way up in the air and just say, I prayed that prayer this morning. Just keep it way up. Wow, look at this. Keep it up. What a powerful moment. What a powerful moment. You just watch people come into the kingdom of Jesus. You just watch Jesus keep his promise by taking the staff of your life and taking control of it. What an incredible moment. A second group of people we got here this morning are those of us that are Christians, but you've let some stuff stack up in your heart. And you say, man, I've carried this stuff for years. I've had stuff against people and negative beliefs and stuff against myself and things that I beat myself up over and my heart... It's just a cluttered mess. And I need to confess it and ask God to make me clean. Would you just pray this second prayer? Would you just say, Jesus, I confess the contents of my heart to you. I repent for letting these things stay in my life so long. And I receive your forgiveness this morning. 
I receive your cleansing. Thank you for making me clean. This room this morning, I can feel it. This room has moved from being stuck to surrendering. From stuck to surrendered. From being stuck to being open. And be prepared this week for God to lead you into new ways and new places. Be prepared for God to begin to teach you. If you'll set your heart to say, whatever you have for me, whatever you want, I'll follow you. He'll lead you out of your Midian into the next place where he wants you to be. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the lives of people that were changed in this room this morning. We thank you for how you're going to work, continue to work this week in our lives. We love you, Jesus, and your strong and powerful name. We pray all these things and preach all these things today. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Let me say, a moment ago, there was over 40 people that prayed to receive Christ in this room. Think about that. That's a powerful moment. You're, if you raise your hand, your next step is to be baptized. So make sure and see somebody to get that done. Church, thank you for receiving the word of God. Thank you for laughing at my jokes. That always helps. And uh, I love you, Jesus. I, I love Jesus. I love you, church. And let's stand and worship the Lord today. Blessings on you. God, you're so forward. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with Pastor Dave, we just want to connect with you. We want to make sure you connect with somebody before you leave. So please come forward and talk with someone on the prayer team. And if you're not comfortable coming forward, that's okay. You can get your phone out right now and you can text in Christ to 97,000 and somebody will reach out to you. We're not trying to pester you. We're not trying to drive you nuts. We just want to make sure that we connect with you and that you have someone to talk to about what is happening, what you feel like is happening, any questions that you have. We are a praying church. We have seen 
seen lives changed by the power of prayer. We have seen healing happen by the power of prayer. So church, we want to encourage you to come forward for prayer today if you feel led. We love y'all so much. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning, and we'll see you back here next week. What an incredible message from our friend Dave Edwards. I love this message so much. Coming out of Easter, where we celebrated life change, whether you are a brand new believer, mm -hmm. whether you made a first time dedication to, to Jesus just within the past couple of days, or you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, mm -hmm. I think that this message can apply to everyone. Yes, so good. I know for me as a parent, this time of year is crazy. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of us are kind of hanging on for dear life and we are moving so fast and we're in the home stretch. Yes, Summer's summer coming. Summer is coming. <laughs> and so, but with school, jobs, a lot of things are just crazy. And so moving in that current can mm -hmm. feel, it can feel crazy. And so getting unstuck and out of that current and being intentional with our time with Jesus, we don't want to mistake busyness uh, for God, uh, for intimacy mm -hmm. with God. So we just want to make sure that we're being intentional with yes. our time. With so him. many practical steps we can yes. take this week. And so we hope you are encouraged and we want to be able to pray for you. And so our prayer teams are coming up at the 316 campus. And so we would love to hear your requests below or head over yes. to our prayer wall where you can share your requests, but also pray for other people. And so know those prayer requests yes. are getting answered, are getting prayed for. And so we are so excited um, just for what's going to happen this week. Cause I yes. know a lot of practical steps um, can happen. Yes. So. And we love the fact that we can connect with you yeah. online. We love the fact that we can pray for you through our prayer wall. Mm -hmm. We love the fact that we can connect with you and help you get plugged in here and even take steps towards baptism, mm -hmm. no matter where you're watching. A few months ago, we had an incredible opportunity to baptize our friend Augusta. Ooh, our friend, we know you're watching. Yeah. Hey, Augusta, <laughs> she watches online and she came here and was baptized. And so I just love that. What, what a great way to celebrate baptism with our folks here, with you that watch online. We love that. We'll do everything we can. Yes. Everything we can to make it happen. So we'd love to love to be a part of that yeah. for you if and, you want to take that next step. And celebrate that life change. Yes, but we're so thankful for you. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you have a great rest of your week. Yes. We love y'all. Thanks for joining us. Love you guys. <laughs>